So here we're getting into the chapter that really our whole semester has been building to, which is hypothesis testing. So the basis with hypothesis testing is, hey, we have an idea about what we think or what maybe that true population parameter is. We recognize that, hey, when we pull out a sample, well, okay, the sample is going to be likely pretty close to that true population parameter, but that sample has a full distribution of possible values it could be. What we want to test is, okay, we don't quite know what the population parameter is, but we do know what sample we took out. So we want to say, hey, how likely is it that the population parameter is what we believe that it is, given the sample that I pulled out? So let's take a look at an example of this. Let's kind of really bring this into that and yeah, see really what we're talking about in that and how that would work out. And then from there, we'll take a look at our hypothesis testing. Really, this is just going to be a very mechanical process. We'll have our five steps to our hypothesis test. These five steps are going to be the five steps expected to be gone through for every question. In fact, bit of a heads up here, when you're examined on this, at least any exam that I give on this, I am literally looking for these five steps. Hypothesis test questions are out of five marks. It's one mark for each of your hypothesis test steps. So as we get into it, these five steps of hypothesis tests are exceptionally important. So let's take a look. Let's figure out what's happening here. So let's suppose that we believe, we believe that hey, a vehicle, a vehicle should, so a vehicle should last 400,000 kilometers uh, before complete failure, right? So before engine failure, right? And really this here, this is on average, right? We would expect that on average, a vehicle is gonna last 400 kilometers before complete engine failure. So here, let's just make some room. Let's just move that guy. Maybe let's move that guy up here. Okay, so if that's the case, what we can say is that, okay, hey, we have some value here and centered around 400,000. Let's suppose that we know, okay, yeah, on average, 400K before engine failure. And let's suppose that we know with a standard deviation of 25,000 kilometers. We want to test this, right? We want to test how true this is. Is this manufacturer's claim legitimate or are they just really pumping them up that their vehicles, that their engines are really well built and last a long time? Well, in order to test this, we want to pull out, we want to pull out a sample. So we pull out a sample and let's say we pull out a sample of 30, right? And by pulling out a sample of 30, we can figure out our sample average and we can determine the likelihood of the manufacturer's claims. So let's say that we pull out this and we test all these vehicles. We just keep driving them, driving them, driving them for a long time. And we find that on average, these 30 vehicles that we tested, on average, some failed in much longer than 400,000, some failed much less than 400,000, but on average, it worked out to be 360,000 between failures, right? So on average, these 30 vehicles that we sampled, they lasted 360,000 kilometers. Okay, so we have our distribution then of X bar. We have a sample size of 30, so hey, that's good. We know, hey, we have a standard deviation of X bar. That's equal to the standard deviation of X. So that's 25,000 all over root N, all over root 30. And then we've pulled out, we've pulled out this sample. So we've pulled out this sample. We'll put it somewhere like here of 360,000. And essentially what we're going to be doing as we do our hypothesis test is we're gonna say, hey, hey, is this sample mean, is this evidence against the null? Sorry, is this evidence against what our population parameter is? Is this like, hey, this is less than 400,000, but is it significantly less? Is it extreme enough 
to be like, yeah, you know what? I don't believe that your vehicles last 400,000 because if they did, this would have been very unlikely, very unlikely. So well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at how unlikely that result is. And we have all the tools in order to be able to do this, right? So for our tools, what do we need to do? We know what the population standard deviation is, right? We're using sigma. So we need to standardize things to a Z. And what we're going to be looking for is the Z value for that 360. And we want to know what the chances are of witnessing this value or more extreme, right? That tells us the likelihood of witnessing the sample we had witnessed underneath the assumption that the population parameter is true. So let's go and work that out. We have Z of... I'm just going to 360,000 minus 400,000 all over my standard errors. Standard errors of 25,000 root 30. Uh, root 30. Okay. So up in the top, that's 40,000. In the denominator there, what do I have? I have 25,000 divided by the root of 30, that's going to give me something like 4,564, 6435. So, okay, 40,000 divided by our answer, that gives us a Z statistic of 8.76. Eight point seven six. You can go to your table. You can try to look up eight point seven six. You'll find that really the table typically maxes out at a value of about three point oh one. I'm sorry, I'm being lazy. This is negative. That is negative. That is negative. Our table typically maxes out at about three point oh nine with a value of point four nine 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 nine. Here we have a Z value of point of 8.76. This is a pretty extreme Z value. Keep in mind that technically our normal distribution goes all the way off to negative infinity, all the way off to positive infinity. That is Z value of 8.76. That gives me that this area here is essentially zero. Now, technically there is a probability of witnessing this, right? Technically, to some extreme decimal places, it might be something like that percent of happening. That's probably even too likely. But what we get with this is that that was an extremely unlikely value of X bar to pull out. That is, if these vehicles should be lasting 40,000 K, if that's what the manufacturer claims, and they claim there's only a standard deviation of 25,000, well, if we pulled out a sample of vehicles, we should have got an X bar much closer to 400,000. That is, in this case here, the fact we obtained this sample mean is pretty strong evidence that the manufacturer's claims are false. Okay, that's the idea behind hypothesis tests. That's the idea behind it. If we just approached it in this kind of way, that'd be a pretty sloppy, unscientific way to approach it because there's a lot of subjectivity that I could implement in this case that is I could just say oh yeah that's that's pretty extreme I'm going to reject the manufacturer's claims but we didn't beforehand state how extreme I needed to be in order to make a rejection right so this is kind of now falling into the realm of subjectivity that the researcher can now just get the result they wanted to so what we need to do is we need to introduce our process as to how to go through this our five steps for hypothesis testing to ensure that we don't introduce any bias, any subjectivity into this process. And we can actually determine, hey, is 360,000 actually proof against the manufacturer's claim? So let's take a look at our five steps of hypothesis tests. As we introduce them, we'll go through what they mean and we'll go through the basis of them as well. So let's jump forward. Let's start by taking a look at the basics. Okay, so let's start off by taking a look at our five steps for a hypothesis test. We'll introduce them all here. In the following little bit, we'll go through and we'll go through the details of what each one actually means and represents. So first, first thing that we need to do is we need to state our null 
and alternative hypothesis. And alternative hypothesis. So our null, this is often uh, written as H naught. Our alternative is written as either H1 or H A for H alternative. What, what these really are, and again, like I said, we'll list them all here and we'll get into a lot of detail following up. But just to kind of give a bit as we work through, so the null is kind of our basic belief. Like, hey, we believe that the population parameter is this, right? Versus our alternative, our alternative would be kind of what we're testing against. Like, okay, sure, maybe the population parameter is that, but maybe it's bigger, or maybe it's smaller, or maybe it's just not equal to that. I don't know if it's bigger or smaller, but maybe it's just not what the null is. So that's kind of our comparison that we're gonna be looking at between our null and our alternative. Again, more, more detail to follow on that. Next, two. After we state our null and alternative is we want to state our level of significance. So we'll go select level of significance. And this is kind of getting back to what I had said in that previous example that we used to kind of introduce bridge in this idea of hypothesis testing is to say, well, how extreme of a sample do I need to witness before I say, yeah, this is evidence against that population parameter. That'd be evidence against our null, right? How extreme do I need? We need to set this ahead of time. We need to ahead of time say, hey, if it's above a Z statistic of 2.8, we will use that as evidence. If it's not above that, well, then we won't. So we'll take a look, a lot of detail as to how we determine this and a lot of the theory behind it as well. Not a lot, but enough of the theory. Third. Third, we're going to identify what test statistic to use. So identify our test statistic. This is essentially saying, how are we standardizing? Are we standardizing using a Z? Are we using a T? Is this a Z for our sample mean? Is this a Z for our sample proportion? Right? So we really need to just make sure we know what tool we're pulling out of the toolbox in order to complete this test. That's really all we're doing in step three here, picking the right tool for the job. Four. Fourth one is we're going to formulate a decision rule. So we will formulate decision rule. And really all that this formulation of the decision rule is, is kind of just taking one and two together and saying, okay, we're about to do our test. If we get a result that's bigger than this, well, we will reject our null. If we don't get a if we don't get a result bigger than that, well, then we'll fail to reject. Our fifth, our fifth step, and and here's the big part with this. Our fifth step, what we're going to do is we're going to take our sample and perform the test. So truthfully, steps one through four, these are being done before we've even collected a sample. These are being done before we even really know what's going on with the underlying data, right? And that's an important part. Unfortunately, given the questions, the way that these are going to be phrased to you, you're going to have the sample. You're going to have all the information to start with. That can be confusing to some. But ideally, when you're doing these, you're going to have steps one through four put into place. Then you take your sample. Then you determine your sample statistics. Then you test. Right. So you're going to take your sample, you're going to perform the test, you're going to figure out, hey, where is your sample mean compared to that true population mean? Is it extremely extreme? Right. Is that sample mean very extreme? In which case you would reject your null. Right. And this is the important part. You'd have to state what you're doing as well. So if you had a very extreme sample mean, like in our last case, we could use that as an evidence against our null, evidence against that true population parameter. Versus the other one, the other case, if we don't have an extreme enough value, we would fail, uh, fail to reject the null. And what we'll see as we go through this, and this is a really interesting bit that a lot of people get hung up on, is we're only ever rejecting or failing to reject. We're never accepting the alternative. We're never accepting the null. It's just either we have enough evidence to reject it or we fail to have enough evidence to reject it. 
And that's really the big takeaway with this year. So let's go take a look at let's go take a look at our first one there, state null and alternative hypothesis. And let's work through this and discuss it a bit further. So state or null and our alternative hypothesis. Let's go back to think about that first question that we introduced where we were saying, hey, a car manufacturer says that on average, their engine lasts for 400,000 kilometers. Okay, in this case here, what we'd be saying is we'd be saying, okay, yeah, okay, that is our null. This is what they're stating the true population parameter is. We want to test this. So the big thing is we go through our null and our and our alternative. Our null is always an equality statement. Right? So in this case here, it would always be our null to be something like, hey, we believe the true population mean is equal to 400,000 versus our alternative. Our alternative is always an inequality. And typically, the difficulty in this rises is reading the question, and usually the question is framed in the alternative. That is, what we may want to do is we may want to go through this and we may want to say, okay, hey, let's test. Test if evidence that these engines last for less than 400,000K, right? So typically we would say something along these lines, like, hey, here's our alternative. This is what we want to test. We want to say, is there evidence to say that, hey, maybe these engines last for less than 400,000K? So, okay, what we're doing in this case, the way that we'd phrase this is we would have our null. We would have our alternative. I always recommend starting off by phrasing, by working out what your alternative is. And keep in mind, what we're making a statement about is the population parameter. We're talking about averages here. So our population parameter, that's mu. So we're talking about mu in some sense in uh, our null and in our alternative. What we're testing, what our alternative statement is, is we're saying, hey, is there evidence that this engine lasts for less than 400,000K? That is, is there evidence to suggest that the true population mean is in fact smaller than 400,000? In this case here, it would always be the case that once we have our alternative statement, our null statement is the remainder. So our null statement being the remainder would be saying that, hey, when in fact the po true population parameter would be greater than or equal to 400,000K. And this is, this is where a lot of you will be like, what? Why, why do we have this greater than? Well, well, let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this. We have, our, we have our distribution, right? We are sampling the, taking out samples to test whether or not we have evidence to say that the true population mean is 400,000. If we're saying, hey, do we have evidence to say, evidence to support, that the true population mean is somewhere down here, well, we're not really interested in this side here. What we're doing is we are saying, okay, boom, we witnessed something there. Is that evidence versus, hey, it could actually be here or it could actually truthfully be way over there as well. We're not testing in this area, right? We're not testing in this area. All we're testing in is this left-hand tail. Hence that mu less than 400,000. Right? Very similarly, we could phrase this the other way. Very similarly, we could phrase the opposite. And we could say, let's change colors just to make sure that we're clear this is the other case. We could say, hey, let's test if evidence that these engines last for more. 
than 400,000K. Okay, well, if we were interested to say, hey, is there evidence to suggest that these engines last for more than 400,000K? Well, again, we would have our null. We would have our alternative. And again, we're dealing with an average situation. So we're, our population parameter underneath interest is our mu, our true population mean. And again, starting off with our alternative, 99% of the time the question is phrased in the alternative. It is test if evidence that these engines last for more than 400,000 K. So that is, I want to say, hey, is there evidence to say that the true population mean is actually greater than 400,000? And that is we're only testing to see if it's bigger. So if we're only testing to see that it's bigger, well, our null statement is that, in fact, it may be smaller or equal to 400,000. And that's the big thing. Always or null always has that equality. Sure, less than or equal to 400,000. And in this case, let, let's see what's going on. So again, we're pulling out a sample. X bar. We have our true population, at least our presumed or null statement here, right? Null statement. Population mean is equal to 400,000. In this case, we're looking over here. We are looking to say, hey, if I pull out a value of X bar to the right of my mean, that is this extreme value, is that evidence to suggest that it's bigger versus my null, my null saying that, no, 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 it's actually equal to 400,000 or maybe even smaller, right? Ultimately, together, the null and the alternative have to account for the entire distribution. So in this case here, as we get into it more, we'd say that in this case, we'd have a right tailed test because right, our alternative statement is saying, hey, mu is bigger. So right tailed test. Final possible situation. Final possible situation is maybe we just want to say, test if evidence that these engines Do not last 400,000 kilometers. Well, uh, that's kind of a little bit misleading. I'd say even with that, do not last 400,000. Many would interpret that to be our first case, that, hey, in fact, they survive less. Maybe, maybe let's phrase that a little bit different. Maybe let's say, hey, test of evidence that these engines... Um, survive an amount different from 400,000K, right? And that is essentially what I'm trying to get at is that really we're not making a statement as to whether or not we think these engines survive longer or whether they survive shorter. We're just saying, hey, is there evidence that these engines are anything different than what's stated? Maybe more, maybe less. We're not sure. We don't have really a thought in one way or the other. We just want to see which way this might be. Well, okay. In this case, all I'm doing, still testing mu. All I'm saying, I'm not saying, hey, I think mu is bigger. I'm not saying, hey, I think mu is smaller. I'm just saying, hey, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's actually equal to 400,000K. So I'm saying, okay, in this case here, my alternative, and that's typically what we're phrased in. That's where we'll start off. We're saying, hey, my alternative is just simply that I'm not equal to 400,000K. Well, in that case there, my null would be to say, yeah, no, 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 we actually are equal to 400,000K. And so in this case here, we would just have equal versus not equal. To kind of view what this would be looking at in the test, well, in this case, we would have our value of X bar. We would sample it to get our sampling distribution centered around our presumed value of the null. And in this case, I'm saying, okay, I might pull out a value of X bar over here, but I might also pull out a value of X bar over here. I'm not sure where it is, right? It could be in either one. And what I want to see is if either of these values of X bar are extreme enough to say that, yeah, yeah, I don't have evidence to say that the mu, that the true population mu is 400,000. I have evidence to suggest that it's different if these values are extreme enough. So that is in this case here. Our null is just saying, yeah, yeah, we're equal to 400,000 plus or minus some kind of uncertainty, some sampling error. 
versus our alternative saying, okay, if these values of X bar are extreme enough, if these values are extreme enough, we'll take it as evidence against the null, against the true population mean is 400,000. So that's our basic idea between stating our null and our alternative. Truthfully, for many, this will be the hardest part of your hypothesis test. The reading comprehension, the critical thinking, to be able to go through it, to be able to decipher from the question what we are testing. What is going on? Do we have evidence? Are we looking for evidence that, hey, we have something bigger than the stated mean? Do we looking for evidence for something smaller than the stated mean? Or are we just looking for something different altogether? So that's really what you're going to be getting at. What we're going to do here, we'll carry on. We'll come back to this as we take a look in the next video of a bunch of different questions. We will really focus on, okay, what is the null? What is the alternative? And kind of your tips as to how to approach them, how to identify them as you go through. Because this is going to be one of your first steps. In fact, this step sets up the rest of your hypothesis test. So it's an important one as we go through. Being able to state that null or that alternative correctly. Next guy then. Next guy, this one here, to be honest, we're going to go into a lot of detail about it. But in reality, in the sense of this course, I will always give it to you. So this step, again, just to remind ourselves, is step two. Uh, let's use white for this, which is select our significance level. Select our significance level. Right, And essentially what this is, is it's selecting our rejection area. It's saying, how extreme of a result do we need to witness before we take this result to be evidence against our null? How extreme is that before we say, yeah, yeah, no, this is evidence against what we think that true population mean is. How extreme in order for that to be the case? And this needs to be set ahead of time. Right, This needs to be set ahead of time so we don't change it once we get our results in order to get the outcome that we want. And so this significance level, this is represented as the Greek letter alpha. And traditionally, we often fall into the trap of using a significance level of 1, 5, or 10%, right? And truthfully, sometimes you'll also see in there 0.1%. Sometimes you'll even see 0 .0, uh, 0 0.01%. Sorry, not 001, but 01%. So super, super, you need a lot of evidence against the null in these cases here. Let's uh, let's talk about what exactly this means, though. And as we talk about what this means, we'll then move on into talking about really how we set this. So let's suppose we have our situation. And here, let's just take in our bit that we know already about say, stating our null and alternative. Let's suppose that we're interested in H0 h1 we'll carry on with the example we've been using such that we're saying hey our null our alternative we'll say that our alternative is saying hey do we have evidence to support that the true population mean is less than 400,000 kilometers versus our null being hey no no in fact it's probably equal to maybe even more than 400,000 kilometers so, okay, we then say, we're pulling out a sample. Here's our value of X bar. Possible values of X bar follow a normal distribution if our sample size is large enough, appealing to the central limit theorem, right? Sample size bigger than 3, 10, or 30, depending on our assumption of the underlying population. And our true population mean, that is our null, is saying we're testing to see if this is 400,000. Do we have evidence to say, hey, this is truly centered around 400,000 or not? What we want to do in selecting the significance level is we want to put off essentially a cutoff region. We want to put in a region. Let's say that we believe we're going to say, okay, we're going to test at a 5% significance level. And we'll talk about where we get these values from shortly right now. And ultimately, as we go through this course, they'll always just be given to you. But we will talk about the idea behind it. If we set a significance level of 5%, what this is saying is we'll put a cutoff right about there such that this area in the tail is 0 0.05, 5%, 
right? That means if we were to take a look at the other bit, this guy, of course, that's 45%. And then the remainder, all of that, that is 50% of the distribution falls underneath there. So essentially what we're doing is by setting the significance level is we're saying, okay, if I pull out some value of X bar, once, right, keep in mind, we don't take this sample, we don't know what X bar is until that final step five, but we're saying when we get to step five, if I pull out a value of X bar and I find it is somewhere over here in this red area, I take that to believe that that is so unlikely to witness, so unlikely to witness that value of X bar, given that this is true, that I'm going to take that as evidence against this being true. And I'm going to say, if I witness some value of X bar that falls in that red zone, I am going to use that as evidence to reject my null. And this is really why we need to set the significance level ahead of time. We need to set this ahead of time because otherwise, maybe I get some value of X bar that is right here, right? Just outside. Maybe this is something that, hey, this value or more extreme, that value or more extreme is something like 6%. Oh, that's so close. And maybe in your heart of hearts, you actually believe that these vehicles survive less than 400,000. So if you didn't set this significance level ahead of time and stick to it, you would now be tempted to say, well, I really do believe these vehicles don't last 400,000. 6% uh, is pretty unlikely too. I'm going to go and I'm going to say, hey, hey, my significance level is 10%. And oh, look at that. Look at that. There's 10%. I'm going to reject my null. Right? And that's problematic. That's problematic because you've now changed what you're doing based off of your results. And that's introducing bias. That's introducing subjectivity into the science. So it's really important we set this ahead of time. Extremely important we set this ahead of time. So that's the idea at minimum of setting our significance level. If we wanted to kind of give an idea behind it, typically, typically we'd use something like 1% for quality control. So something that's, you know, pretty big stakes on that, we would set a 1% significance level, right? That'd be a situation such that we're like right there or more extreme of 1%. Very unlikely to witness a sample come in that zone if this is true. Uh, the 5%, typically 5%, we'd use this for consumer research. Consumer research. And then finally, 10%, 10% is political polling. But keep in mind this whole 1, 5, 10% really is a trap. You can pick any level of significance required, any level of significance that truthfully works for what you're looking at. We could test at a 3% level. We could test at a 12% level, right? It is entirely based off of the needs of the researcher. So big thing with this as well, where we put this rejection region, right? Where we put this 5%, was entirely based off of our alternative hypothesis. Let's take a look if we phrase this a little bit differently. Let's say if we were looking at that other case that we introduced where it was, okay, here's our null, here's our alternative. And in this case, maybe we're saying, okay, we actually believe that they last for more than 400,000, okay? Versus my null being that, okay, maybe they're actually less than or equal to. 400,000. Okay. Again, let's set a significance level of 5%. So in this case here, we would have our presumed distribution of our sample mean. That is, we presume X bar is normally distributed if our sample size is large enough, centered around 400,000. And in this case, we are stating significance level of 5%, but Keep in mind, looking to my alternative, I'm saying I believe that the mean is greater than 400,000. That is, I'm going to put this 5% area underneath the curve. I'm going to put this rejection zone somewhere over here this time, right? Such that again, this rejection zone 
would be 5%. And if I end up in step five, getting some sample mean that falls within this red area, I would take that as evidence against my null. Evidence against the fact that the true population mean is 400,000 or less. So our alternative statement is really driving where this area fits. Final possible case, of course. Final possible case is that we had a null. We had an alternative. We're still dealing with mu. And in this case here, we're just saying, hey, it's not equal to 400,000. We don't know how long these engines do last. We're just saying, hey, it's not equal to 400,000. Again, we'll set a significance level just for consistency. We'll continue to set this at 5%. So taking a look, we have our presumed distribution of X bar normally distributed if our sample size is large enough. There we go. We're centered at 400,000. But in this case here, all I'm saying in my alternative is that I'm not equal to 400,000. I'm not having a statement of direction. I'm not saying, hey, I believe that it's bigger. Hey, I believe that it's smaller. I'm just saying that it's not equal to. So in this case, I'm going to have two rejection zones. I'm going to put one over here and one over here such that, right, I'm saying, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to get a value, a sample mean bigger. I don't know if I'm going to get a sample mean smaller. I'm just going to have these two zones such that both of them together are 5%, right? Because that's my total rejection area. My total significance level is 5%. In this case here, symmetric distribution. So 5% total area, meaning that would be 0 0.025, 2.5%. This would be 0 0.025. So right in the other bit, we would have this half over here. That would be 475. And then similarly, this half over here, also 475. So in the case where we do not make a statement of direction, where we're just saying, hey, mu is not equal to 400,000, we need to split that significance level into two sides, put one in each half of our distribution. Together, we're still at that 5%. That is together, we're still at alpha, right? That is over here, that there was just equal to alpha. Here, that's alpha over two, alpha over two. Up above, right, up above, this rejection zone that we took a look at, that was again, just equal to alpha because it was one tail. That entire rejection area got put in that one tail. So, that's our idea behind our significance level. That's how in practice we put it in. But there's some problems with this, right? There are some problems with this. And that is that this here, this level of uh, that we set for alpha, we can also think of our significance level as our level of risk. And that is, keep in mind with our distribution, we're setting a level that's actually still part of that distribution. That is, if we set a significance level of 10%, let's take a look at our distribution here. Here's X bar. Let's suppose we're doing a one-tailed test. Uh, there's my mean. Let's say we're doing one-tailed test, left-tailed test. This here, my significance level, there's a 10% chance, a 10% chance that I get some value of X bar in this zone. That means in one out of 10 samples, I am legitimately getting a value of X bar in that zone with this being true. Yet despite that fact, despite that one out of 10 times that would happen, I'd be saying that that is evidence against this being true. And that's problematic, right? That, that is an error. That is a mistake. That is falsely rejecting this true population mean. That's saying, okay, I witnessed a mean over here. Uh, that's pretty unlikely. So I'm going to reject my true population mean. It may be unlikely, but it could also just be the result of dumb luck, right? just sampling error. Just all of a sudden, by some reason, every sample you pulled out in that case was very small. It happens sometimes. It happens sometimes. 
So the thing is, is the bigger your significance level, the bigger you set alpha, the more likely you are to reject your mean and the more likely you are to falsely reject your mean. And what we would call that, we would call that a type one error. And the type one error is the probability that we reject our null given that the null is actually true. So probability we reject our null given that the null is true. And that's, that's our problematic part there. Let's take a look at an example to really drive this home. And uh, let's, let's change things up. So far, we've been taking a look at our distribution of sample means, x bar. Let's, uh, let's take a look at a distribution of uh, p bar, right? We can do this just the same. It's still a normal distribution. So here we go. There's p bar. If our conditions are met, distribution of sample proportion will be normally distributed centered around that true population proportion. So let's put a bit of a backstory to this. Let's suppose that you're working in a procurement office and you are expecting a, you're looking to get a contract and this contract is for the delivery of 5,000 new vehicles for your company fleet, right? This is a massive delivery. You're like completely refurbishing your entire company fleet, nationwide fleet. What you have though is that part of your contract, you can't have a whole bunch of vehicles having problems, right? You want, hey, you, if you're meeting this, if you're fulfilling this contract for us, you need to be delivering us quality vehicles. So you go and you put in, you state in your contract that no more than 3% of vehicles can be defective, right? Keep in mind that that is of our 5,000 vehicles being delivered. You're saying that no more than 3% can be defective. And truthfully, you're getting 5,000 delivered. That's your population, right? That's all 5,000. That is out of all of them being delivered, no more than 3% of them can be defective. So, okay, you take delivery, you have this, you now need to inspect and make sure, did your supplier uphold their end of the bargain? Are the vehicles actually high quality or are they all defective? Clearly you cannot go and sample, sorry, clearly you cannot go and test all 5,000 of these, right? That'd be ridiculous. That'd be absolutely ridiculous. So what you would have to do is you'd have to pull out a sample of these vehicles and you would have to go and take a look at that sample and say, okay, do I have a whole bunch of defective vehicles in the sample or do I not? Well, let's suppose, let's suppose that you, let's suppose that you pull out a sample of 200 vehicles. So you pull out a sample of 200 and you want to go through and you want to say, hey, is there evidence to suggest that I have more than, more than 3% of my vehicles defective, right? That's what I'm really looking at. Hey, is there evidence to suggest that more than 3% of these are defective? So, okay, what would be our null? What would be our alternative in this case? Let's, let's phrase that. Null, alternative. I want to know, do I have evidence that more than 3% are defective? So, okay, I'm taking a look. In this case, my population parameter is P, right? As we've seen, we can also see this as pi from time to time as we come up in both ways. And I'm saying, okay, do I have evidence that I have more than 3% defective vehicles all together in this population versus my alternative or versus my null rather? My null is no, no, no. In fact, in fact, they have met their deal. The true population proportion of defected vehicles is 3% or less, right? That is, they've met, they've met their contractual obligations. So there'd be our null, there'd be our alternative. Let's suppose that we wanna test this. Let's suppose we wanna test this at the, let's say we wanna be pretty sure. We wanna test this at the 1% level. So that is, we go, we take a look at our alternative statement here, and we say, hey, I want a case such that probability is greater than 3%. That's my alternative, that's what I wanna test. So greater than, I'm putting that over there. All right, keep in mind, I'm saying 
my no, 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 true population proportion is equal to 3%. So that is, I'm saying this. There we go. And I'm putting a significance level as such. 1% chance, right? Very, very unlikely to get over there. Okay, so there we go. We have this stated. Let's say that you now go and collect your sample. So you go and collect your sample and going through this, you sample your 200 vehicles and you find that out of the 200 vehicles, 24 of them are defective. Is this a problem? Is this a problem? Well, if we work out what that sample proportion is, 24 out of 200, that's 12%. Right? That seems like that is pretty bad. That seems like that's a lot of defective vehicles, 12% of our sample being defective. That seems to be a case like, hey, we just found a value of P bar out there. And hey, we should take that as evidence against evidence against this true population proportion. And we should send this shipment back. We should say, sorry guys, you failed to uphold your end of the bargain. Here's your shipment back. We're going to be going with a different supplier. We found a ton of defective vehicles. But hey, keep in mind, maybe this was just an error. Maybe just in random sampling, when you pulled out these 200 vehicles, maybe in the entire population, maybe only 24 were defective. Maybe in the entire population, Right? Let's say a little bit more extreme than that. Maybe that in the entire population, something like 50 were defective. Right? That would be something like a 1% defection rate. That'd be okay. Underneath your contract, you would be okay with that. That looks like a so. This is 50 are defective. Right? So it could be dumb luck. It could be dumb luck that, hey, you just happen to sample entirely, get a ton of defective vehicles in your sample. That happens due to the nature of random sampling. That is possible. It's unlikely, but it is possible. In this case here, you have just falsely rejected your, you've just falsely rejected your no. You have said, hey, look, I found 12% of my vehicles being defective. That is not okay, we are not good with this, your contract is being denied, we're sending the vehicles back, we're rejecting the shipment. But this is a mistake. This is a mistake. It is simply just that, hey, you had a bad sample. You had a bad sample. And that can happen. This here is strictly an example of a type 1 error. A type 1 error. The probability that we reject our null when in fact the null is true. Right? This here, 0.01, that is our true population proportion. Right? If we said that in fact there were 50 defective vehicles in the entire 5,000, true population proportion is in fact 1%. We just by pure dumb luck pulled out a sample mean of 12%. Sorry, not a sample mean, a sample proportion of 12%. Extremely unlikely but it can happen. Extremely unlikely though. So type one error, uh, our probability of witnessing a type one error. What's our probability of witnessing a type one error? The probability of that occurring is our significance level, our alpha. So the bigger we set alpha, the bigger the chance we witness a type one error. The smaller the value for alpha, the less likely we occur a type 1 error. But keep in mind, there's always a chance of witnessing a type 1 error. The chance that we falsely reject our null. What do we have for a significance level here? 1%. So it's pretty unlikely, but even at that, it, it could still occur. Okay, there's another side of this too, though. We took a look at a type 1 error. We also have, we also have a type 2 error. And a type two error is the probability that we fail to reject the null when in fact the null is 
false. So that is, we don't get evidence to reject the null. We get evidence to say, yeah, we think our null is true, but in fact, the null is actually false. And this is problematic as well. And we would say that the probability of witnessing this, we would say that our probability of witnessing this is beta. And let's take a look at really our same scenario. We're going to have a population of 5,000 5, trucks. And we're going to pull out a sample of, what did I say, 200. And we want to figure out, hey, is there evidence to say 3% are defective or not? So same kind of null, same kind of alternative. All right, alternative is saying, hey, is the population proportion actually greater than 3% defective rate versus my null saying, no, 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 it's actually is 3% or less. So right in this case here, same as we had it. There's our value P bar. Normally distributed if our conditions are met. We're saying, yeah, we believe, we want to test about whether or not this is truly centered around 3% or not. And again, let's use our significance level of 1%. So we put on our cutoff region, something like that, such that, and this guy here is 1%. That's my alpha. That's my probability of a type 1 here, the chance that I falsely reject this uh, null. But right, we took a look at that type one error already. Let's take a look at this type two. So in this case, we go through, same kind of idea. We go, we sample, we sample, we sample, and we pull out 200. And out of these 200, we find that, well, pull out 200, we find four defective. So, okay, we work that out, P bar. Four defective and a sample of 200. Four out of 200, that is 0 0.02. That is, hey, if that's 0 0.03, we've just witnessed a value of P bar somewhere over there. Hey, that's, that's actually not bad. We're saying that's less than our 3% from this sample. That's pretty good. Okay, cool. We're good, we can accept this shipment, right? We have less than 3% effective. That's what our contract said. Contract is good, let's go, let's carry on. But, okay, problem. What if in fact, what if in fact, in our true population, in our true population, there's 250 defective? right? We just pulled out a sample. In our sample, we only had four defective. What if in the true population, there was 250 defective? That is, our true population proportion is 250 out of 5,000. That is 250 out of 5,000. That is our true population proportion is a 5% defection rate. Ooh, if that's that true population proportion, we have a problem now. Our sample is saying, yep, yeah, we're good, let's carry on, let's accept this. But in this case, through just dumb luck, through just the nature of random sampling, somehow, again, this would be unlikely, somehow we only sampled vehicles that were working properly. We missed over all the defective vehicles. Somehow this happened, it'd be an unlikely situation, but somehow it occurred and we obtained a sample with only a 2% defection rate problematic, right? This is a type 2 error, is we're saying, yeah, 2%, cool, we're good, we're going to fail to reject our null. But this is, in fact, what the true population proportion is, meaning we should have, in fact, rejected our null. We should have said, no, 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 we have evidence against it. But given random sampling, we did it. That's a type 2 error. And what we have here, type 2 error, probability of that happening is beta. Really what's happening here is we can think of, we're always testing under the null. So right, always under the assumption that the null is true. There is actually a true distribution out there, a true distribution of P bar based off of what the true value of P is, but we don't know this, right? We don't know what that true value of P is most of the time. And so it might be that in reality, this distribution looks something more like this.
There we go, centered around 5%. Here's the value that we pulled out, which in the scenario here that I drew, that's a pretty extreme value. Let's maybe make that a bit better. Let's say that's our value we pulled out, just so that actually fits on my diagram. And we see that, okay, it was actually pretty unlikely to get 2% in this true distribution. That's really 0 0.02. That guy there. Now let's use the same colors just to make sure that that really. All right, that's that guy there. That's our two percent that we pulled out. Very unlikely to have witnessed that, given this true distribution centered around the true population proportion. But what we witness is that hey, if this is alpha, if we draw that line down, our probability that we fail to reject our null, given that our null is false. Well, this beta, this is going to be determined by this true distribution. And our area of beta, that's going to be all of this. That's the probability of occurring a type 2 error. And so what we're ending up witnessing with this is that as alpha decreases, as the probability of a type 1 error gets smaller, well, the probability that I make a type 2 error gets bigger. Alternatively. As the probability I make a type 1 error gets bigger, the probability I make a type 2 error gets smaller. And, and we can witness this, right? Let's go throw in, instead of a 1% significance level, let's put in a 5% significance level. Oh, let's put in a 5% significance level. So there we go. Let's say something like that. That's 5%. So alpha got bigger. As alpha got bigger, the probability of making a type 2 error that's this guy here, that got smaller. So I have this inverse relationship between my two errors. Alpha, alpha we pick. We pick alpha, we know exactly what that probability is. Beta, we don't know what this is. And the reason we don't know what this is is because we don't know what this distribution is. This is a ghost distribution. It is there, we know that it's there. Uh, maybe ghost distribution wasn't a proper word for that. It's not like ghosts are there. We know we're there. This is a true pop, uh, true, uh, true distribution, though, that is there. We just don't know that it's there. We just don't know that it's visible, right? We believe we're testing under the assumption that this null is true. We have no idea what that true population proportion actually is. That's why we're testing, right? That's why we're testing. So we know what alpha is. We can set alpha. We do not know what beta is. So in that sense there, as we set alpha, we have to keep in mind this trade-off between our choice of alpha and the impact that has on beta. Keep in mind, we never know what that beta is, right? We cannot figure that out. Let's, let's keep this in mind. Let's take a look at an example that's really going to drive this home because it's like, oh, okay, well, why don't I just pick alpha and forget about beta because this is this unknown ethereal thing that I can't really think about anyways. Well, okay, let's, let's take a look at an example and let's work through this. Let's suppose, let's suppose that you are, um, that you're rock climbing. Okay, so you're rock climbing. When rock climbing, if you've ever gone rock climbing, before you go climb, you go and you check your knots. The person belaying you checks the knot to make sure that the knot is tied properly. And this is important because if the knot is tied correctly and you fall, the rope will save your life. If the knot is tied incorrectly and you fall, the knot could come undone and you would die. So in this case here, you're doing a sample, you're taking a look at the knot and you're determining whether or not it's tied correctly or not. We'll say in this case here that your null is that it is tied correctly. Versus your alternative statement, your alternative is that it is not tied correctly. And that is if it's not tied correctly, you'd want to retie it to make sure that it's that it is tied correctly. So in this case here, we have our two possible errors. We have our type 1 error. Type 1 error, this is that we reject our null given 
that the null is true. So, okay, in this case here, we reject our null. So we say, if we reject our null, we believe that it's not tied correctly. So type one error. This would be saying that it was not tied correctly, but it actually was tied correctly. So, oops, we made a mistake. We retied our knot, but it was actually tied correctly. Versus our type 2 error. What's going on with our type 2 error? This is that we failed to reject the null, given that the null is actually false. So, okay, we fail to reject the null. That is, we take a look at it. We're not rejecting the null, so we're saying tied correctly. Tied correctly, but it is not. That is, we falsely make the claim that this knot is tied correctly. Okay, taking a look at these two errors, which do you want to minimize? Which of these errors, right? They're always both going to be there. All we can choose is our significance level, our choice of alpha, right? If we want to take a look at that, probability, probability of type 1 is alpha. Probability of type 2, that's beta. All we can choose is our alpha. Which out of these do we want to minimize? Do we want to minimize alpha? Do we want to minimize our type 1 error? Or do we want to minimize our type 2 error? In this case here, I would want to minimize my type 2 error. I would want my type 2 error to be as small as possible. That is a case where I'm looking at my knot and I'm saying, oh yeah, nope, everything's good, but it's not good. And in fact, I fall and I die. That is, I would want to, in this scenario, I would be willing to set a very high level of alpha. That is, there's lots of times that I'm going to be rejecting my null when in fact that null is true, I'm going to be retying a lot of really good knots, but that's better than the alternative, right? That is better than the alternative. So although I cannot control what beta is, I can push beta down by pushing up alpha. Bigger significance level, bigger your probability of a type 1 error, lower the probability of a type 2 error. So we have that going on in this case. Alternatively, alternatively, let's take a look at another one. In this case, let's suppose that you're a structural firefighter. You're a structural firefighter and you are searching a building for people who are maybe stranded in there. You have two different kinds of situations. We're going to say that your null, your null hypothesis is that there's people in the building. Doing a little bit of abbreviation here, building, BLDG, people, just PPL. Your alternative is that the building is clear. Keeping in mind, your job in this case is to make sure everybody is safe. Your job is to make sure that everybody's out of the building. What do we want to minimize in this case? So what are our two options? We have our type 1. That is probability that we reject the null given that null is true. So what is that? We reject that people are in the building. So type one error, we say, we say that it's clear when it's not clear. So uh oh, people are in the building, but we're saying, nope, we cleared the building, everything's good. Type 2 error. Type 2 error, we fail to reject the null when, in fact, the null is false. So, okay, in that case there, what's going on? We fail to reject the null, so that is we believe... We believe that people are in the building, right? We're saying, no, no, we can't reject this. We're saying that this might be true, but it's actually clear. In this case, which one of these do we want to minimize? Well, 
your job as a firefighter, well, to extinguish the fire, but also make sure that everybody is out safely. So if you're really, that's your job, that's your role. You don't want to be leaving people behind in this building. What you're really trying to minimize is your type one. You really want to minimize your chances of saying that it's clear, saying, yep, there's nobody left in the building, when in fact there are still people left in the building. And in this case here, right, type one air, that's alpha. Type two air, that's beta. In this case here, you would really want to minimize your type one air, set your significance level really, really, really low. Maybe, right, maybe this is something like a 0 0.001 significance level. But recognizing that by setting a really low significance level, you are increasing your probability of making a type 2 error. You are increasing your probability that you are searching this building because you believe people are in there when in fact everything's good. So always the trade-off between the two. Really as a researcher, you need to identify which type of error is more relevant, which type of error is more important to your study, and you need to minimize the correct one. All you can choose is alpha, right? That's all you get to choose is your alpha. And thus, you choose your significance level appropriately. Okay, whole bunch of background there, whole bunch of ideas behind our type 1, type 2 errors, the big thought process that would go into choosing our significance level. Really, I get into this to kind of be like, don't fall into that trap of using 1, 5, and 10%. Yes, typically that's what's reported, that's what is used, but it doesn't have to be. From here, from here, for the remainder of this course and everything, I will always be giving you your significance level. I will always say test at the 5%, test at 3%, right? I'll always give you alpha. So all of this was just kind of the idea, the theory. You'll need to know that. But when it comes to the application, you'll always have the significance level provided. Well, that's our step two. Step three, what's our step three? Step three was to select our test statistic. Select test statistic. So ultimately what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be going back to your null, go back to your null, back to your alternative. And essentially what you're doing in this case here is you're taking a look to say, okay, am I asking a question about mu? Or am I asking a question about the true population proportion, right? And then, okay, I'm going to have some kind of statement as to, hey, this is equal to or greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. Sure, but that's not really what we're getting at in this case. All we're looking at is going back to your step one. Are we asking about the true population mean or the true population proportion? From here, you need to then work out which test statistic, which standardization statistic is really what we're going to be utilizing. That is, are we going to be utilizing a Z or will we utilize a T? So let's start over here with our population proportion because, hey, that's always the same. Population proportion, if our conditions are met, right, this is all our binomial conditions in NP, N1 minus P. These guys are both greater than 5. If that is good, well then, P bar is normally distributed Z such that P bar minus P all over P1 minus P N, right? And we could standardize in that way using this standardization statistic. If we're over here on the left-hand side, well, we need, what we need to do is we need to first go and say, can we appeal to the central limit theorem, right? That is, will we be pulling out a sample size greater than three, greater than 10, greater than 30, depending on our assumptions, right? So this guy here, X being normal, X being symmetric, and X really being anything in that case there. If we're 30 or more, X can be whatever it needs to be, that's fine, and our sample mean will still be normally distributed. Once we're good for this, once our central limit theorem is met, we have another separation to take a look at, and that is to say, do I know my population standard deviation, or did I have to estimate it 
with a sample standard deviation. Let's go and work through what that means in each case there. If I have a population standard deviation, great, then my sample mean x bar is going to be normally z distributed. And I can go x bar minus mu all over that standard deviation of x all over the square root of n. Sorry, I said z distributed. It's not z distributed. It's normally distributed. We can standardize it to a standard normal is what I mean in that case. Alternatively, if we don't know what our population proportion is and we had to estimate using our sample standard deviation, sorry, if we don't know what our population standard deviation is and we had to estimate it using our sample standard deviation, I think I said proportion there, then what we need to do is we're no longer normally distributed, we're now T distributed. If we're T distributed, we need to standardize using a T n minus one, which will be equal to x bar minus mu all over our sample standard deviation all over root n. So based off of what we have here, we'd go down a different route. This is what we're doing in our step three, is we're kind of going through this kind of which tool am I pulling out of the toolbox? If I am using mu population mean, can I appeal the central limit theorem? If yes, am I dealing with a population standard deviation? Great, standardize with a z. Am I dealing with a sample standard deviation? Great, standardize with our t. If I have population proportion, well, is my sample proportion normally distributed? Are my binomial conditions met? Is NP and 1 minus P greater than 5? Yes, okay. Then we can standardize with a Z. So one of these three is what shows up in our step three. We need to go through a flowchart along these lines and figure out what we're utilizing. And all we're doing in step three is we're just writing this down just so that we know, so that we can kind of refer back to it. That's it, step three, done. Step four, okay. And step four, we will formulate our decision rule. That is, we will come up with a situation to determine when I'm gonna reject, when I'm going to fail to reject. So in order to demonstrate this, let's go through an example and let's really kind of show what's happening here. So let's kind of set up this example. We'll set it up very similar to what we had looked at in that previous bit there. So let's go take a look at that. Okay, so let's suppose that we're dealing with the case where we say our no, our alternative, and let's say we're dealing with this case still that, hey, I'm saying, is my mean less than 400,000 versus is, in fact, my mean greater than or equal to 400,000? So that's my step one. Step two, step two, let's state our significance level. Let's say we want to test this at our 5% level. And then step three, Let's suppose that we knew in this that our standard deviation of x was 25,000. So, okay, right, this is just going back to that initial example we opened up with where we said this was the case. So going through that flow chart for step three, we're kind of saying, okay, we're dealing with a population, right? We're dealing with a population mean, that's our parameter, so mu. So, okay, I'm going down that route. Is my sample size large enough? Well, okay, we'll eventually pull our sample. Essentially, we're saying we're going to need a sample size greater than or equal to 30. At the start, we said, yeah, yeah, we have a sample size of 30. So, okay, we'd be golden there. And then do we know our true population and standard deviation or are we estimating it? And in this case, we know sigma. So, okay, we have Z, which will be X bar minus mu, all over sigma x root n. There's my first three steps. Step four, I'll just jump over beyond this and take a look at step four. I'm gonna to wanna to take a look at my distribution. So here's my distribution. 
I am normally distributed if central limit theorem is met. There's my x bar. I am centered around my null hypothesis of 400,000. This could just strictly be me. I don't even need to put a number here. And really what I'm wanting to identify is this significance level. I want to put in my cutoff region. So, okay, I want a 5% significance level. Keeping in mind, I'm saying, hey, my alternative is that mu is less than 400,000. So, okay, I want to put in some cutoff region such that this guy here, that is 5%, right? And my alternative is saying I'm looking for a mean less than 400,000, so I'm strictly looking in the left-hand tail. Okay, what I want to do now in my step four is I want to figure out, I want to figure out what that value is. That is, I need to go and figure out what my corresponding Z value is. And again, the reason why I'm doing a Z is because in step three, I said I had a Z. And what I want to do is I want to find out essentially it's going to be my critical value. This would be our critical value or a Z critical value. So let's write that down. Z critical value. That's what I'm looking for here. That's this guy. Z critical value. And the way I'm going to get that Z critical value is by recognizing that if my significance level is 5%, 5% on the tail, well then this bit here between my Z critical value and the mean is 0 0.45. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to go, want to go to my stats table. And I'm going to want to find out which Z stat, which Z value has a probability between that value and my mean of 0 0.4500. Or at least which one is closest to, right? It's not always going to be exact. So if you go into your table and you look that up, you'll find that, again, that split right between 1.64 and 1.65 so we can say that this is negative 1.645. So there we go, my Z critical value, negative 1.645. Okay, what's the point of this critical value? What are we doing with it? Well, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to formulate our decision rule. So in formulating our decision rule, we're gonna state, explicitly state, what is going to happen? What is our criteria as to whether or not we reject or fail to reject? So in doing that, what we would say is, right, our whole idea is we're saying, okay, if I calculate some value of X bar in this red rejection region, well, I'm going to reject. But okay, keep in mind, any value of X bar in this red rejection region is going to be a Z value smaller than negative 1.645. So I can phrase it in that way. I can say, if I calculate some value of Z smaller than negative 1.645, then I will reject my null. Otherwise, right, we don't always have to put this, but otherwise I will fail to reject. So essentially, this here is my decision rule. This is what I can look back to when I finally do my math in step five and say, okay, where am I sitting at? What is my final case? Do I have a Z value less than that critical value? Or do I have a test statistic? That's the one that I calculate, which is greater than. Well, if it's greater than, that's somewhere over here. Well, all that yellow bit, that's all failed to reject right? That's all good. That's all fine. I don't need to worry about that. So that's my decision rule. First four steps. Keep in mind, these are the first four steps. I'll show you right now how the marking goes on these guys. One mark for correctly stating your null and alternative. This guy here, I give this one to you. So no, you don't get a mark for that. One mark for this guy. One mark for getting the right test statistic, identifying the right tool. Finally, one mark for correctly stating your decision rule, right? So you've identified the right side. Hey, we're negative because we're to the left, and I have the right one, and I've stated this correctly. If Z is less than negative 1.645, reject my null.
Okay, I said these um, these kind of questions were out of five marks altogether. The last two marks come from step five, right? Step five is where we actually start to do the do the math, actually answer the question. All we've been doing in steps one through four is just set up. That's it. That is really, you can get three out of five marks. You can get 60% of the marks for this question just by being able to set it up. And that's that's a big part, right? Is being able to follow this setup through. So step five now. Okay, in step five, let's go. All step five is, is our this side. That is essentially in step five, we pull out our sample, we figure out what our value of X bar is, and then we compare our X bar to our critical value, or rather the standardized value of that X bar to our critical value. So let's go right back to the start where we first introduced this. And if I recall, we said that we had a sample size of 30 and we pulled out a value of X bar of something like 360,000. Right, and we're saying, okay, is this evidence for or is this evidence against? And we actually got something ridiculous with this. Um, we got like a Z stat of like eight. So let's let's update this a little bit just so that we get a different result so that it's surprising. Let's in this case here, let's suppose that we're dealing with, let's say a little bit closer. Let's say we pull out an X bar, this case of 300 and let's say 90,000. So quite a bit closer in this case. So we want to figure out, okay, we've pulled out this value of X bar. Where does this X bar fall in the distribution and is it evidence against our null? So we want to calculate our test statistic. So what we're doing is we're just going to go right to step three. We're going to say, hey, this was the tool we're using. Let's use it. So, okay, that's the tool. X bar, that's 390. Minus my mean, that's from my null. So 400,000. Okay, all of that divided by my standard errors. What are my standard errors? Well, we said that we had, there we go, standard deviation, population standard deviation of 25,000. So 25,000 all over the square root of my sample size, square root of 30. Okay, so on the top, I have negative 10,000. In the bottom, I have 25,000 divided by 30 to the 0.5, that's the square root of 30. So that is I'm dividing by 4,564 dot, uh, let's say three, five, uh, we'll go four, six. We'll carry around a few extra decimal places there. Okay. So 10,000 divided by that, that's gonna give me a Z statistic of negative 2.19. Okay, so Z statistic of negative 2.19, great, cool, we have a number, you're not done. If this is all you reported, you would get only one out of the two marks for step five. Your final mark for step five is actually what this value means, what you end up doing with it. That is taking step five, referring it back to step four. So what did we say in step four? We said that if our Z value calculated was less than negative 1.645, we would reject our null. Hey, negative 2.19, that's smaller. If we wanted to visualize that, negative 2.19, that'd be somewhere around there, right? That'd be something like that, negative 2.19. That's in our rejection region. So what would we, yeah, what would we say? We would say, therefore, we will reject the null. That is, if we pulled out in a sample of 30 cars, if we found out that on average, they were only surviving 390,000 K, we'd say, hey, that's only 10,000 K less, but given our standard deviation, or at least our stated standard deviation, that is still so extreme that I'm going to say that's a pretty unlikely result. That is a fairly unlikely result, and I'm going to use utilize that as evidence to reject my null. So there's our five steps. That is how we would go through this problem. That is the crux of hypothesis testing. What I want to do 
I want to work through this question one more time. I just want to take a look at the difference where in this case here, I'm going to say instead of this being a population standard deviation, I'm going to say that this guy is estimated and it's a sample standard deviation of 25,000. And we're just going to take a look at how that changes things. So let's take a look at that. Let me just clean up a bit and then we'll take a look at that equation. Okay, so if we were doing it this way, we would still have the same null and alternative. We would still have the same significance level. The first bit that's going to change, and I'm going to use different colors just to really make it pop that we're doing something different here, is step three. I still have my population mean, so I'm still going down that route. I have a sample size of 30, so I'm still good for my central limit theorem. But in this case, I have my sample standard deviation. So that is I'm going to be using a T statistic. T n minus 1, so I'm going to write down that this is a T 29, and that will be equal to x bar minus mu all over the sample standard deviation all over root n. So a little bit different, but not too bad. From here, what we want to do is we want to then, for step 4, same distribution of x bar, right? It's still normally, well, not normally, it'd be T distributed now, but it still looks like a symmetric bell curve. In this case, we would standardize x bar to a t29, such that we'd be looking for the value of a t29, such that we have 5% in the tail. So to do that, right, we would go to our t table. We would go down the left-hand side to t29. And then we would go and we would take a look till we find an alpha, right? That's where that alpha comes from on our t table of 0.05. So in that case there, T29, 0 0.05, that gives me a T statistic of negative 1.699. So we see this is a little bit larger than our previous case, right? Not significantly larger, but a little bit larger than our previous case. Of course, right, you can also look up this T value using Excel. You can refer back to that other video that I posted as to how to look up. Uh, the actual T value from a probability in Excel, and you can get it in that way too. Of course, Excel is always going to give you a more accurate result. The T table only ever giving you it rounded to three decimal places for the specific values of alpha. Step four, though, we want to finish. We would want to explicitly state our decision rule. So in this case, our decision rule would be if the T29 that I calculate is smaller than 1.699, I would reject my null. So if my t29 is less than negative 1.699, I will be rejecting my null. Okay, so that's step four. So far, right, one, 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 that'd be three out of our five marks. Finishing off, step five, what are we going to be doing? Same thing we did before. We had our sample size of 30, and we had our value of x bar of 390. Um, let's go, yeah, you know what, let's just keep the same value. I was going to change it up just to play around with things a bit, but let's keep it the same. x bar of 390,000. So, okay, let's go and we'd calculate what our value is of our t29. So x bar, 390,000 minus our mean, right? All we're doing is we're taking step three and we're working it through. Minus our mean of 400,000, right? Keep in mind that true population mean that always comes from our null. We're gonna take that and we're gonna divide it by our standard errors. So sample standard deviation, still 25,000, all over root n, uh, that's the root of 30. So that gives me negative 10,000 all over, uh, 25,000 divided by 30 square root. And that gives me, again, same number. I just couldn't remember what it was. 45, 64, and 3, 5, 4, 6. Again, we work that out. 10,000 divided by our standard errors, and we get our T statistic this time of 2.19. Negative. 
right? Same as we worked out last time in this case because all of our numbers are the same. This time though, it is a T29, not a Z. But to finish off, we would compare it to our T statistic in the exact same way that we would have to our Z, right? And in this case here, we're saying, hey, yeah, our T29 is less than negative 1.699. Therefore, I will reject my null and reject my null and then boom, there we go, we have our results. So if we had a T statistic, that's how we would go about this. One more to work through and let's use a T again just because it's a little bit different. Let's go and update all of this. Let's say that we're looking at that last case where I'm just saying, hey, maybe the engine survived 400,000, maybe they survived something different than 400,000. So let's rework that and let's see how that changes things as our final example here. So in this case, what we're going to evaluate is, is the survival of engines different than 400,000 kilometers. And then keep in mind what we know, we know that we have a standard deviation of X of 25,000. Actually, sorry, we said we're gonna keep using our T. So that is we have a sample standard deviation of X of 25,000. We're pulling out a sample size of 30. And was there any other bit of information we knew? Mm, yes, we ended up pulling out our own value of X bar of 390,000. Okay, so, and really then we're gonna say, test if, let's just move that guy over, test if the survival of engines is different than 400,000. Okay, so step one, our null and our alternative. Well, in this case, all we're saying is let's test if it's any different. We're not saying, hey, test if the engines survive less than 400,000. We're not saying if they test greater or test if they last longer than 400,000. We're just saying different. And this is where you really need to focus in on the question and not your value of X bar. And given the nature of this, right, X bar will appear in the question and you'll have this information. But realistically, you wouldn't have any of this until after you've gotten to step five. So bit of a problem given the nature of it, but one we can overcome. And the reason why I say that is because often people will end up looking at this sample mean and they'll say, oh, clearly X bar is less than mu. Therefore, we'll be testing no alternative. Hey, X bar is less. So we're gonna be testing, hey, is mu less than 400? But no, 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 that's not what the question is actually asking. What the question is asking is test if the survival of engines is different than 400,000. So essentially I'm just saying, hey, is my true population mean any different than 400,000? That is that it's not equal to 400,000. My null then, my null would be that they are in fact equal to 400,000. Okay, working through that. Let's test that again at a 5% significance level. Step three, uh, pull out our test statistic. Which tool are we using? Well, okay, we're using our mean. We have a sample of 30, so we can appeal to the central limit theorem. And okay, I'm gonna have my sample standard deviation. So I'll be using a T29. And that there, X bar minus mu all over. Uh, sorry, all over the sample standard deviation, all over the root of my sample size. Great, first three steps done. Step four, let's formulate our decision. So I can appeal to my central limit theorem. So that is my distribution of X bar is going to be bell shaped. All right, it's technically not normally distributed because I have my sample standard deviation, I'm using a T. This is centered around my true population mean, which is assumed to be 400,000. And in this case, looking to my alternative, I'm just testing to say, hey, am I different than 400,000? 
So that is I'm putting in a rejection region here. I'm putting in a rejection region here such that my entire rejection region, both the left and the right tails, equals 5%. So that would be this guy here is 0 0.025. This guy here is 0 0.025. And I would have to look up accordingly for that. Keep in mind, right, if we were dealing with a Z, this middle bit, this middle bit, that would be 0 0.475 and 0 0.475. But in this case, I'm not standardizing to a Z. I'm using a T29. So T29, we're going from that to that. What I'm looking for is these cutoff values and need to find that. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to jump to our t-table. If you're comfortable using Excel, you can use Excel, of course, for that. But for this, let's jump to our t-table and look at it this way. So we'd be going down the left-hand side till we get to 29 degrees of freedom. And in this case here, this is where it gets a little bit off because you're like looking at that t-table right at the top. It says alpha and then you find. But okay, keep in mind that they on their t-table defined alpha is just that area. This here, in fact, is R alpha over 2. So that is, we would want to look up this 0 0.025. So 0 0.025 down to 29 degrees of freedom, we get 2.045. Negative 2.045. So now we have our critical value, right? That's our T critical value. That's going to be our cutoff. If we get a T that is more extreme than 2.05, so either bigger than the positive one or smaller than the negative one, right? We end up in this zone or that zone, we would have evidence to reject our null. Two ways we could explicitly, explicitly phrase this decision rule. One's pretty long-winded, I don't like it. The other one is significantly shorter, but some people get confused about this. So let's take a look at the long-winded one first. So I would say that if, if my T29 is less than negative 2.045, or my T29 is greater than 2.045, I will reject my null. The other way that we can write this that's a little bit more concise is I can just recognize that, hey, this is just t being greater than 2.045 in magnitude, irrespective of sign. So I could say that, hey, if the absolute value of my test statistic, t29, is greater than 2.045, then I will be rejecting my null. And so I can work through it in that way there as well. Either of those are fine, but right, you have to be careful that you're using the right one, right? That you don't accidentally use this for a one-tailed test or that you set this to be less than 2.045. Really have to understand what you mean by using that absolute value. So steps one through four, all we've done so far is just set up the problem. It's not until step five that we're actually really starting to put the rubber to the road and do the math. So let's take a look here. Step five, we had our sample size of 30. We had a value of X bar of 390,000. We need to now figure out where is that corresponding T stat with respect to our critical value. Do we reject? Do we fail to reject? So we go back to step three. We pull that test statistic out and we solve for it. So our T29, is going to be equal to x bar minus mu all over s of x root n. So again, 390,000 minus 400,000 all over 25,000 root 30. Okay, so that's negative 10,000 all over. 4,564 and 3,546. 
which once again, right, shouldn't be a big surprise. We knew what this answer was going to be, 2.19. Again, negative 2.19. So, okay, where do we fall in this zone here? Oh, we're actually quite a bit closer in this case, right? By doing a two-tailed test, by pushing that rejection region into both tails, we've pushed out the fail-to-reject region. 2.19, well, there'd be 2.04. 2.19 would be somewhere more like that. So something like that would be negative 2.19. But even though it's closer, it's still in our rejection region. So even though we've gone to a two-tailed test, we were not sure about which tail this was going to fall into, uh, we would still say with that T statistic, we would go, therefore, we would reject our null. So therefore, we would reject our null. So how we would work that through in this case here. Okay, those are our five steps of hypothesis testing. Make sure you follow through with them. As I said, explicitly following through these five steps is how you will be graded. Uh, being able to go through it, it will be very clear on a test. One mark, one mark, one mark, one mark, one mark, or your five marks altogether. Uh, sorry, I should say that one mark, that's more for your explicit statement of your decision rule. So how that works through typically on an examination scenario. If you have any questions on how to work through these, take a look at the following video that has a whole bunch of examples, working through a bunch of hypothesis tests for both sample mean, sample proportion, Zs, Ts, all of them. Take a look at those, get comfortable with that. If you're lost, feel free to comment on D2L, feel free to reach out to me by email. Thanks, till next time.